Good morning. Whoa, that is really on. We welcome all of you this morning into our Calvary Church home. Um, both regular attenders and guests, we want all of you to feel at home. We also welcome those who are watching online. Um, we miss you. We look with joyful anticipation to the time when you can all come back. Uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, just a few things to, to mention, just some details. Um, we have hand sanitizers at the doors uh, to the church to help us all be thoughtful of each other. And we have also uh, in the same locations offering boxes so that we aren't spreading germs, passing offering plates. We have offering boxes. And um, then we are also asking that you wear your masks and wear them when you are going to be closer than six feet to each other, both inside and outside. And then also wear them when you sing. And that's just a way for us to, some of us, it's a way for us to consider others more important than ourselves. <laughs> it takes a little bit of discipline for some of us, uh, some of us rebels. We are here to worship this morning. I think most of us with, we are so, we have such a more keen appreciation of uh, the opportunity to worship together. What if we couldn't worship together? A while back we didn't worship together. So here we are today, we can worship together. And in this place, we can do it interacting with each other. We can do it through singing. We can do it while we listen to the teaching and preaching of the word. Um, incidentally, we will be uh, reading scripture uh, today from Psalm 1. And then we will, Michael will be giving us a sermon from um, 2 Peter chapter 2. And um, just overall, just we get to worship. And we worship our creator, our savior, our father. And we get to get do that together. And so we ask you to join us with um, hearts of joy. Thank you so much. Coming through. Here we go. All right. Welcome, everybody. Great to see you all on this wonderful morning. Let's stand and sing together. For those of you uh, watching at home or watching this later, uh, we have the we have the song lyrics posted in the description. So. Uh, Download that, sing along with us. We're going to start today with Christ is Enough. Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. 
I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. turning back I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within upward i look and see him there who made an end to all my sin because a sinless savior died my sinful soul is counted free for god the just is satisfied to What a promise that is, that we, those of us who have repented and believed in Jesus Christ, that our lives, our hope, our future are hid inside Christ, 
and we find our confidence in him. What a great promise that is. Please be seated and open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, the first Psalm, for our scripture, for our scripture reading this morning. Psalm 1. And as we read together in the first Psalm, I would remind you that this is God's word for us today. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. For his delight, but his delight, is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither in all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Father, we come to you today acknowledging this stark reality. In a world that sometimes it seems is eager to divide us into all kinds of categories and cultures and races, identities. From heaven you look and you watch and there are only two groups of people in your world. There are those who are in Christ, the righteous. Not righteous because of ourselves, but righteous because of what he has done. And there, there are those who are still outside of Christ. And Father, this is a stark reality that should sober us. And as we'll come to the text this morning, we'll be reminded of not only the temporal, but the eternal realities that are in play in this astonishing truth. We pray that we might be humbled, not only as we come to the word, but as we worship together, as we exalt your great name even as we fellowship together, Father, may we recognize the great honor and privilege, the incredible blessing, so many blessings that we have received and we engage in this morning. The blessings of a free land, the blessings of the affluence that you've given us, the blessings of the opportunity we have to exercise our faith in freedom. And we pray that we'll be always mindful of these things. But far more significant is our citizenship in an eternal kingdom and the security that that brings. And as we'll see, the holiness that that should produce in our lives. And for all these things, we thank you. We recognize that there are some who are in our family who are not with us today because they are still concerned. Appropriately so. They are in vulnerable categories. They want to remain protected as much as possible from the virus that seems to be nearly everywhere, it appears. And so I pray for their safety. I pray that soon we'll be able to be back together. I do pray for their physical well-being and their emotional, spiritual well-being as they are isolated from us and others. Father, we continue to pray for wisdom. It seems like in our leaders there is such a short supply of discretion and wisdom. And yet we pray that you would, in unusual ways, you would direct the affairs of our land and even of this world in ways that are for the good of people and for your glory. And Father, we pray for our church that we will see these days not overwhelmed with frustration, but we will see them as given to us in your providence, which is often mysterious to us, but for the purpose of drawing us closer to you and perhaps in darkness more brightly demonstrating your light and your glory. Father, to that end, we pray even for our service today. As we come under your word, that you would encourage those who are discouraged, that you would inflame those who have grown cold and callous. We pray that you would help overflow with joy those who are walking in obedience. And if there are any in our midst who have never in a real and personal way experienced what it means to be forgiven and redeemed and rescued, I pray that through your Holy Spirit, you would do a powerful work this morning. 
We also pray for the other faithful churches in our city who hold high the word of God and have a high view of who you are and are passionate about sharing the gospel. We pray for Craig and his crew at Oaks Bible today, that you would bless them as they are struggling to reopen. We pray that you would protect their health and protect their testimony in the gospel and continue to mold and work in that body of Christ in that place. Now, Father, this is your day. This is your church, not ours. So we pray that we would know your presence in it. We believe that somehow you have planned from eternity what you will do in our midst in these few moments in this place. And so we rejoice in that. We look forward to your spirits working. We pray that you might be pleased. As the word tells us, you search for those who worship in spirit and in truth. And our desire is that you would find those kinds of worshipers here in this place this morning. In Jesus' glorious and precious name we pray. Amen. Our God is holy. Let's stand and sing as we prepare our hearts for his word. Holy, holy, holy. Lift your voices with us. be seated. As we begin this morning, I'd ask you that we'll be in 2 Peter 2 for our message. I'd ask you to begin with me in Luke chapter 13. 
Luke chapter 13. Would you turn there to begin? And let's consider the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 13. Not a well-known story in the life of our Lord, but one that we refer to from time to time. And it's principles, what we learn from what Jesus says, certainly apply to what we're going to talk about from 2 Peter 2 this morning. Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or of those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You can understand why this is not a story that's often told in Sunday school or vacation Bible school, right? It's Jesus' way of essentially saying, you want to know why trouble comes? A better question is, what might happen to you? You better watch out. There is a sense of judgment in the world, and from time to time, God opens the curtain, as it were. He opens the curtain and lets us see his true view of disobedience and sin and righteousness. He allows the consequences of our sin to be wrought forth in natural circumstances, and that can be painful. It doesn't mean we can always find a one-to-one -one correspondence between tragedy and sin. That's not the point. But the point is, for those of us who look at heartache, and we look at injustice, and we look at tragedy, and we say... Why does God allow that to happen to innocent people? Essentially, Jesus is saying, be careful, nobody's really innocent. And I wonder if it could not be that we've gotten so used to mercy that when we see justice, we think it unjust. Have we become so used to God being merciful that when we see an instance of justice, we think him unjust? Too often there's a level of skepticism about God's ultimate justice. This shows up in different ways. It can perhaps be in our own hearts because we are in despair over what seems to be so much injustice that is escaped, or justice is escaped, and therefore there's injustice. We look at our own lives, we look at the world at large, and we see sometimes that people seem to get away with so much, and we wonder about God's ultimate justice. Or on the other hand, and this is a significant problem in our culture, and Peter's going to address it in the text this morning, there's an idea at large that God doesn't really judge sin. That judgment and ultimate accountability, it really has no place in the message of Christianity. At the most, it's just a metaphor to explain the reason we should pursue goodness, but really there's nothing to fear, nothing to see here. Move along. The superficiality of our culture there's often a skepticism about God's ultimate justice. But from the Garden of Eden, God has been very clear about his verdict regarding sin. In Genesis 2.17, he says this, For in the day that you disobey or sin, you shall surely die. Death began at the moment of the disobedience of our first parents. And this is God's consistent verdict about sin. Sin brings about isolation and separation. Sin brings about death. There is judgment. There is justice. So what does this have to do with us? Do we recognize that God is holy? That as the New Testament says, God will not be mocked. That what a man sows, that he will reap. Do we recognize that God is holy? Are, are we living in light of that fact? Because that's one of the things Peter wants us to get out of this letter near the end of the New Testament. He wants his readers and the Holy Spirit wants us to understand that we live for more than just time. We live for eternity. And there will also be a reckoning. There's a time in which there will be an account given. There's a judgment to come. Are we living in light of eternity is the way we've said it over the last couple of weeks. Are we living with eternity's values in view? 
Because the people to whom Peter was writing, they'd been influenced by this here and now theology that says basically just worry about here and now and don't worry about the future. Don't worry about giving account. Don't worry about a holy God. And Peter writes his letter. The Holy Spirit gives us the book of Second Peter to challenge us to recognize that there is more to life than the here and now. There are aspects that are eternal. And at the end of the day, the question is this. What difference does it make? Does it make any difference in the way you and I live that one day Jesus will set up a kingdom? Does it make any difference in the way you and I live that one day people will have to give an account? Does it make any difference at all that God is holy and that God is just? Look with me in 2 Peter chapter 2. And for our reading this morning, we'll begin back in chapter 1 with the last verse because it sets some sense of context. 2 Peter chapter 2, but we'll begin, begin with verse 1, chapter 1 verse 21. And we'll read down through chapter 2 verse 10. So follow along in 2 Peter beginning at the very end of the first chapter. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 21. There the Bible says this, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Note the adjective, destructive. Even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift, noted again, destruction. And many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle. And their, here it is again, destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, and if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day by day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard, then... The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge in lust of defiling passion and despise authority. We will pick up with chapter 2 verse 10 next Sunday. But the first thing about this text that is applicable to our lives, especially concerning for those of us who love the church and who love the local church, is the responsibility to watch, the responsibility to watch for it. Because what we have here is Peter, the Holy Spirit, through the pen of Peter, is telling churches all through time, you need to be aware, just like Israel dealt with false prophets, you need to be aware of false teachers. There will always be the tendency, the possibility, the potential for false teaching. And believers in Jesus, followers of Jesus, have to be alert. This is a personal responsibility. It's not just to the elders, as important as the elders' tasks are. But it's to the entire membership of the body of Christ. And so, let's work through verses 1 through 3. And let me just show you some of the some of the aspects that are here about false teachers. Notice it says in verse 1, but false prophets, uh, he's just referred to genuine prophets back in chapter 1, right? But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. So w what Peter is saying is this is not a novel problem. This has been the case ever since God instituted truth. There have always been voices that say, think about it, has God really said has God really said this? Does this really mean that? There's always been this problem. 
And these who, these false teachers among you, they will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Now, let me pause there for just a moment. Let me tell you that the swift destruction is often not swift enough for us. It doesn't look sudden enough to us. But from God's perspective, it will come suddenly, it will come unexpectedly. And I would just remind you, this will be a theme we'll return to, is that the kind of judgment we want for other people is usually not the kind of judgment we want for ourselves. But for these false teachers, there is swift, sudden destruction that God promises. Verse 2. And many will follow their sensuality. It's a gross word. It, it, it's a word for debauchery. It, it's a kind of a reckless sexuality. Many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And the way of truth is just shorthand for the gospel. In the book of Acts, there, you find this reference to, and those who follow the way, it says, or the way of Jesus, or the way of God. It's shorthand for what you and I would call Christianity. And the problem is these false teachers have such a seductive way of teaching what they teach, and then they have such a carnal and debauched way of living, and as we're going to find, their motive is nearly always greed, and they will gather a following around them. And when they do, the name of Christ is besmirched. The reputation of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, is smeared. And that's a problem, obviously. Look in verse 3. And in their greed, still talking about the false teachers, in their greed they will exploit you with false words. As opposed to Peter's claim back in chapter 1 verse 16 where he says, we didn't present to you cleverly devised fables. But on the other hand, these false teachers, they exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. Now, here's the problem. You look at any screenshot of any particular moment where people, especially in power, have pursued immorality, people who are false teachers have accomplished by gathering a following, and at any screenshot at any particular time, it may look like, it may look like that their condemnation is indeed idle. It may look like that the, their destruction has fallen asleep. But if anything, what this passage is telling us is you just need to prepare. And as we're going to see, you don't only watch for it, you have to wait for it. But right now we're emphasizing the watching for it. And we have to just address the troubling issue of who are these false teachers, so much so that they are part of the church. They're so much part of the church that it says that they deny the master. It's a strong term for the Lord Jesus it, it's, it's used in the term of, of like a, a slave owner who owns slaves. He's a master. This one, they deny this one who bought them. How can this be? Because they are promised here destruction. And this is not just trouble in their lives. This is eternal destruction as we're going to see. And so what we find here is that the specific concern of the text is not for outsiders who spout error. It's, it's not for the average, in our con context, we would say the average intellectualist, the faculty member at the average university who rejects God, rejects the Bible, has no interest in Jesus. The, the concern in this text is for people who have made some identification with Jesus. They, they, they are not outsiders or pagans necessarily. They are part of the church, as it were, but they are pretenders. This is the language of phenomenon. I say it that way because I can't, I practiced all week phenomenological language and I never got it right. Phenomenological, phenomenological language. So it's, it's the language of phenomenon. It's Peter saying it looks like the Savior has bought them. But what you find is they deny that they've been bought by the Savior in reality. They've made a profession, they've given appearance of being genuine, and they've even wormed their way into teaching posts in the church. Now, let me just stop here. I recognize that that sounds like special pleading. Uh, we believe that uh, the colloquial way to say it, it's, it's usually not a helpful way to say it, but just bear with me. We believe once saved, always saved. We believe if you're truly in the faith, then God protects you 
He, uh, he helps you persevere, and you will never be lost. But you read a text like this, and critics would say, you see, you all are just special pleading there because you're saying it only appears that they were a believer. And indeed, that's what we're saying. They had the appearances, so much so that Peter would talk about it in terms of the master who bought them by appearances, but there was no reality there. And so you may think that that's special pleading, and it's not really consistent and not a fair way of dealing with this troubling issue because it appears that Peter says they're going to lose their salvation. But you see, all we're doing is we're just acknowledging what Jesus acknowledged. Do you remember what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7? He says, on that day, talking about the day of judgment, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name and pastor large churches and write a lot of books and have a lot of people come to our conferences? You see, did we not do that, Jesus? And what will Jesus say to them? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Jesus is describing in Matthew 7 the precise people that Peter is concerned about in 2 Peter chapter 2. Those who by all appearances, it looks like they're in at least superficial appearances. But by their fruit you know them. And ultimately their teaching and their lifestyle and their greed become manifest and they will experience judgment. Now let me give you quickly four characteristics of these false teachers. We find these characteristics here in these verses. The first characteristic is deception. They come in cleverly. They come in secretly, it says in verse 1. Deception. And since Eden and Eve, Satan has been in the deception business. He works in falsehoods. He works in half-truths. He works undercover, as it were. No false teacher stands up and say, now by the way, I'm going to teach this morning, and everything I teach is heresy, but I want you to listen to it. No heretic has ever said that. Uh, these truths that are really falsehoods, the falsehoods are brought in undercover. The characteristic of the false teachers, the first one to note is deception. The second one is sensuality. And remember, this is what's happening in 2 Peter. Uh, basically, the false teaching in 2 Peter was something like this. You know what? Don't worry about holiness. Don't, don't worry about the way you practice your sexuality. Don't, don't worry about the way you treat your neighbor. Because just find yourself fulfilled because this life is all there is. Live it up. This was the false teaching. Don't worry about the judgment. Don't worry about the coming kingdom. Jesus coming back, that's just the idea that the Jesus presence is in the world. And we have his stories and we have his teaching. By the way, does that sound familiar? And so these false teachers were essentially saying that you can live it up now. That it, if it feels right, it can't be wrong. As the song from a previous generation claimed. It was a life of sensuality and they pursued sensuality. The third characteristic is greed. Greed. They were hawking defective goods and they were doing so to make a living. Later on, we'll see this next week, the text says that their hearts were trained in greed. What a metaphor that is. They, they had bachelor's and master's degrees in greed. They were well trained in it all. They were greedy. And they were more concerned with popularity and acceptance and approval and ultimately money than they were the truth. And we keep speaking of these false teachers in the past tense, but we need to remind ourselves that what the Bible is telling us is there will be those same kinds of false teachers today that are deceptive, that pursue sensuality, that are greedy, and fourth, they pursue and teach and hold to heresy, falsehood. They are unorthodox regarding doctrine and the truth. They seriously and intentionally misrepresent the truth. In 2 Peter, it was the idea that you don't have to worry about eternity. You don't have to worry about God's judgment. But it's been different heresies all through time. But in this text, when Peter describes them, he says they were denying the master who bought them. You see, if there's no master to please, then we're left to please only ourselves. Think about it. If there's no Lord to follow, if there's no master to submit to, then we are our own God. This is the reason the message is so appealing. 
It's the reason it's just the same error that gets recycled over and over and over again. If we had time this morning, we could go back into Revelation chapter 2 and 3 and we could show you that this, these were the kinds of problems that Jesus addressed to the seven churches. This idea that functional holiness doesn't matter in one way or another. It's a false teaching. It's heretical and it denies the master. And I could give you examples all through history. I think of the Catholic Church and its ritualistic systems and the immorality of its leadership and its legalisms and its false gospel that tells people to just trust in rituals, not in the saving grace of Jesus. I could talk about all the cults that had their or origin in Christianity. Cults like the, the Mormon Church and cults like the Jehovah's Witnesses, that their original uh, seeds of their, of their beginnings were in the Christian church. But these were false teachers. I could talk about all the Elmer Gantries of history who gave off maybe biblical doctrine and yet we found out that their lives were filled with sensuality and sin and disobedience and they caused shame upon the gospel. But a particular problem in our culture today and in the church today a particular problem are the prosperity preachers and teachers. And they include the biggest ones, Joyce Meyer, Joel Osteen. Anyone who says essentially that you have your best life now, mark it down, they're a false teacher. And they are defined by deception and sensuality and greed and heresy. And all of this brings shame upon the way, the text says. The way of the gospel, the church. It, it shames the reputation of the bride of Christ. And these are particular problems today because in our world today, biblical absolutes are rejected. In fact, they're considered archaic, if not embarrassing, to say right is right and wrong is wrong. And yet this is what the Bible does consistently. There's this overriding skepticism about absolute truth in general. And one commentary that I've been using here in 2 Peter says... Pluralism and tolerance have become the new gods. It was written in 1996. Think about that, how far we've come. Pluralism and supposed tolerance being the ultimate values, the gods of our culture. So there's this passion for pragmatism and this, and this practicality. And what it does is it leads to a de-emphasis on doctrine and on truth. And so in very many churches, the churches are given over to just giving four ways to balance your checkbook and five ways to raise healthy children. And that's what they consider preaching to be. And the idea that you would labor in a text and you would seek to understand what the text says seems foreign to many churches today. Now listen carefully. It doesn't mean that every church that doesn't preach exactly like we do is a false church. It's not the point at all. But the point is we are immersed in a culture that is driven by practicality, that is driven by pragmatism, and that kind of culture will feed upon the false teaching that has plagued the church for 2,000 years. So we must be aware. We must watch for it. That's the first point. We must watch for it. Now all of these examples that I've mentioned, which you don't hear me usually do, but this is the subject of the text, all of these examples, many of them seem to get away with it. And there's a problem here, and the problem is the problem of delayed justice. It seems like they get away with it, so do they get away with it? Well, if we're to watch for the false teaching, we also have to wait for the judgment. And that's my second point this morning, you have to wait for it. And the text gives us three examples of divine justice. If you have your Bible still open there in 2 Peter, look down in verse 6 of chapter 2. You notice when he's describing Sodom and Gomorrah, he says, He condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. It appears very often that false teachers have escaped or are escaping, but not so forever. Often we just have to wait for it. The Bible is filled with examples. Remember, God gave the Amorites 400 years, the Canaanites 400 years to fulfill their iniquity. And all that time, the people of Israel were suffering in bondage in Egypt. And once again, if you just take a screenshot, 
of any particular day of Israel's bondage in Egypt or the immorality of the Amorites, you would say, look, they're getting away with it. And God says, wait for it. Wait for it. There are consequences. Remember consequences? My grandson who was taught when he was young and he didn't understand the word consequences and thought they were saying Wisconsin. And so his parents would say out in public, it was convenient. They'd say, you're going to Wisconsin. <laughs> this is simply the consequences. These are the consequences of disobedience and of false teaching. There is a future divine justice and it is certain. And the argument of Second Peter is you can be certain of it in the future because you can see that God has done it in the past. And then he gives three examples. And these three examples, they're off in the book of Genesis, and they're in order through the book of Genesis. And I just want you to notice that Peter takes them at face value. He, he doesn't make them metaphors. He doesn't try to draw some kind of esoteric spiritual principles out of them. He says, this is what God has done, therefore you can know what God is going to do. Three examples. The first is angels who sinned. Angels who sinned. Look in verse 3. The end of verse 3 says, Their condemnation, these false teachers, their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. And then he goes, and he, and he goes into what is one of the longest sentences in Greek in the New Testament, essentially showing that this destruction that God promises, this condemnation that God promises, it will show up sooner or later. Verse 4, For if, and that's the first if, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, now, Peter here was referring to a Jewish tradition interpreting Genesis chapter 6, the sons of men and their sin with the daughters of the sons of God and their sin with the daughters of men. And essentially, we believe what Simon Peter was doing here through the Holy Spirit is he was affirming the accuracy of that tradition. That what happened, somehow we don't understand it, but in Genesis 6, demons recognize the beauty of women and somehow... Because remember, angels are able to appear in physical form. Somehow they engaged in sexual relations with the daughters of men. And it's called in the book of Jude, it's called the angels not staying within their own position. And this was a grievous sin, and it was designed by Satan. You recognize it was designed by Satan to thwart the plan of God for his creation. What did God do to them? He cast those angels into hell. It, Peter uses a unique word there for hell. It, it's out of the culture for the abode of the dead. It seems to be a temporary holding place, and we believe that's the case. Because look what it says. He committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Now the first illustration just says this. Follow the thinking now. You think God's not going to bring judgment? Even angels, when they sinned, God judged them. So angels weren't exempt. When angels sinned in this grievous way, there were consequences that the angels experienced. Angels who sinned, that's the first example of divine justice. Secondly, the world and the flood, beginning in verse 5. And you could say, and if, this is a second argument, and if God did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, how is he a herald of righteousness? Genesis doesn't tell us this. Again, the Holy Spirit affirms Jewish tradition that, ha that during those years of Noah building the ark, the very act of building the ark, he was a boat builder in the desert, folks. He was building a boat in a desert. The very act of that was a proclamation of his confidence that God was going to judge the world. And so there's this faithfulness of Noah. He was a herald of righteousness. He was preserved with seven others, that is his family, when God brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And what we find here is that the flood is a prototype of the, of the corrupt cultures and people that, that are radically rejecting God. And early in creation, God says, let me show you what happens when culture goes to the end of the road. This is what happens. And you see the problem and even as I stand here in Santa Barbara, California, I think about how the average hearer in this city would respond to this story. Do you really believe that? It's laughable to them. And it was laughable to the false teachers of Peter's day. It was laughable to the people that saw Noah building an ark in a desert. But God's judgment does come. The 
God's future judgment was laughable to the ancient world, and it's laughable to false teachers today. And God just patiently waits. Why does God wait? Why is it that God is, he delays justice? We, we want justice quicker when, it, when, when we experience injustice, don't we? And yet the mysterious truth that we find all through Scripture is it appears that God is slow in exercising justice because he wants to give mercy. He is willing to wait and be merciful. Oh, by the way, this is what was happening with the children of Israel, with Rahab coming upon Jericho. And the, you remember that odd story of how they circle the, the city for six days in a row, and then they circle on the seventh day and it finally falls? What was God doing with that? There, there was no strategic purpose to that at all other than this, for the people of Jericho to heed the message of God and repent. God stays his judgment to give an opportunity for people to turn, for people to repent. What does the Bible say right here in 2 Peter? We'll, we'll deal with it in a few weeks. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but patient toward you. Why? Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come or reach repentant. repentance. And then the text also tells us in verse 5 of chapter 2, that God in mercy, he also has his eye and his hand on the remnant. Noah and his family, they will be vindicated. So judgment comes, it's delayed, it's slow from our point of view, but God is being patient. But then when the judgment comes, the remnant are vindicated and delivered. And then you have the same thing with Sodom and Gomorrah, the third example. In verse 6, and if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, the same Greek words are used to describe Vesuvius, which was destroyed by a volcano. If by turning the cities of Sodom to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day by day, he was tormenting his righteous soul. Do you notice that? It says he was tormenting. The ESV is the only translation that translates it that way, but it's a very accurate translation, and I like it, because basically what it says is Lot was responsible. It's not just that he was tormented by circumstances, but Lot made decisions, and in his decisions, he caused the tormenting of his own soul. He was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. So here there's fire. And we're going to see fire again before we're through with 2 Peter. Fire is promised as part of the ultimate coming of the kingdom, the, the renovation of this earth. There is judgment coming. And yet again here there's a remnant. It's righteous Lot. Now, I think I've probably told you before, but if I haven't, you can hear me now. To me, Lot is one of the most despicable characters in the Bible. If you know his story, it's like I, I don't have any respect for Lot. And yet, I have to acknowledge that the word of God in its inerrant authority calls Lot righteous. And it re really shouldn't surprise us. You remember, Abraham is dealing with God about his destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, far be it from you to do such a thing to put the righteous to death with the wicked. There's some way in which Lot had a covenant relationship with the God of Israel that he was declared righteous. We see some of it in Lot's interaction in Genesis 19. When, when the men of Sodom are coming trying to, to take and abuse the two angels, he says, men, don't do this wicked thing. So he's trying to stand up for righteousness. And evidently this was a habit of his, we can assume, because they say, who made you a judge over us? But still, the, New Te the Old Testament especially uses the concept of righteous in a dual way. It's a righteousness of status, and then there's also a quality of life, a practical sanctification. And I don't think anybody looks at Lot's life and say, says he was really chasing after holiness. But he was still in covenant relationship with Yahweh, with the God of Israel. Or the God of Abraham would be a better way to say it. And so sadly, Lot's righteous soul was saved, but he lost everything else. Lot's not a prototype for how to be righteous. You get that, right? I often think that Paul was thinking of Lot when he wrote in 1 Corinthians about those who were saved, but as by fire. I would say it by the skin of their teeth. 
And we have to recognize that Peter is acknowledging that judgment will come, but even in judgment, God will be faithful to those who are his own. But as we've said all along in the book of 2 Peter, there are also, while God will preserve and deliver, we have some responsibility. We need to pursue faithfulness. We can't look at the story of Lot and just say, well, when the fire falls, we're going to be okay. So it doesn't matter whether we live in a, a holy life. That's precisely what the false teachers were saying. You say, well, it doesn't seem like it ever really makes a difference. And I hear you. There's a wonderful story that's told of Elie Wiesel, the Nazi hunter. He told this story. He said, a just man comes to Sodom hoping to save the city. He pickets. What else can he do? He goes from street to street, from marketplace to marketplace, shouting, men and women, repent. What you are doing is wrong. It will kill you. It will destroy you. The citizens of Sodom just laugh. But he goes on shouting until one day a child stops him. Says, poor stranger, don't you see it's useless? Yes, the just man replies. The child asks, then why do you go on? And the man says, in the beginning, I was convinced that I would change them. Now I go on shouting because I don't want them to change me. Someone has said it this way. One great security against sin lies in our ability to be shocked by it. And I ask us all this morning, when you see these sober truths about God's holiness and God's judgment and the fact that remnant, we will indeed be delivered, but we will be delivered with responsibility. And the question I have to ask myself and ask you is, are we willing to shout so that we don't be changed ourselves? Are we still shocked by sin? We need to watch for false teaching. We need to wait for the judgment. And let me give you the point, and I'll move to my conclusion. The point is simply this this morning. Listen carefully. God's sure faithfulness, his faithfulness in judging, his faithfulness in bringing about responsibility, his accountability that's so sure in this text, it's exemplified with the angels, it's exemplified with the flood, it's exemplified with Sodom and Gomorrah. God's sure faithfulness cuts both ways. God's sure faithfulness cuts both ways. And what I mean by that is there's rescue for the righteous, but there's retribution or condemnation or judgment for the guilty. And the same faithfulness of God that promises he will rescue the righteous at the very same time he promises that he will bring accountability and judgment to the guilty. The faithfulness of God cuts both ways. And this is the argument of the text. This is the summary of the text. Look at it in verse 9. In all of these verses, back from verse 3, he said, if God does this, and if God does this, and if God does this, if even in his justice is certain, if God also has delivered his remnant, verse 9, look at it, then the Lord knows how to re rescue the godly from trials. And verse 9, the Lord also knows how to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. The faithfulness of God cuts both ways. It promises rescue for us who are in relationship with him, and it promises judgment for those who are guilty. I wonder who we relate to in this chapter. We can't relate to angels. There, there's no forgiveness for these angels who sin. It's hard to relate, for me at least, it's hard to relate to Noah and his family. But I think it's pretty easy to relate to Lot. Now, we have to recognize when we're talking about false teachers, we're, we're not talking about every doctrinal disagreement. It doesn't rise to this false prophet status that Peter is condemning here. And, and, and not every moral flaw represents apostasy. Lot is an example of that. Listen, God's people are not perfect, but in Christ we are forgiven. We are accepted. We are rescued. And I want you to think with me for just a moment about the fact that God's sure faithfulness, it cuts both ways. Rescue for the righteous. Think about Peter. Because Peter knew that God knows how to deliver his own out of trial. Do you remember the story from Acts 12? He's in prison. And remember, he gets released by an angel. He was under trial, and God releases him. This was his experience. But I want to remind you of another experience that Peter had. 
He's used a phrase in this chapter called, they deny the one who bought them. What did Peter do on the night of the arrest of Jesus? He denied his Savior. He denied him three times, didn't he? Peter knew about denial. But he also knew about the gospel. He knew that God doesn't save perfect people. God saves repentant people. God, God doesn't look for the righteous in order to bring them into his family because all of us are rebels. And he's willing to save those who repent and believe. There's rescue promised for the righteous. This is the gospel. But there's also this retribution and condemnation for the guilty. We read verse 9, look at verse 10. Especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Despise authority is just rebellion. We'll talk about that more next week. But the point of all of this is that the judgment is already happening. Uh, the judgment has already begun. We might not see it, but it's already begun. Sometimes God brings about judgment through circumstances, through what's called the law of the harvest, that which one sows that he will also reap. If you read in Romans 1, you find that God gives them over because of immorality. He, he lets them experience the consequences of their sin. And sometimes that consequ those consequences are devastating. You see, what the Bible teaches is this. Now think with me now. It's not that people who refuse to believe the gospel will one day be under condemnation. John 3, Jesus himself says they are presently under condemnation. They are dead men walking. At the end of John chapter 3, where we find this glorious promise of John 3, 16, we also find these words at the end of the chapter, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God, what's the word? Remains on him. This is judgment. And it's temporal judgment. But the terrifying thing is, and there's terror in these truths, the terrifying thing is that temporal judgment does not exhaust the wrath of God. Death, present suffering, the angels that are held in some kind of prison right now, none of these exhaust divine wrath. And if that concept makes us uncomfortable, then I would remind you one more time, we've gotten so used to mercy that when we think about justice, it appears to us as unjust. But where does this leave us? Does it leave us comfortable, perhaps even self-righteous in our redemption? Does it leave us, remember, like the Pharisee? Thank God I'm not like those other people. Does it leave us careless about the lost? When we think of God's judgment, do we think of it in terms of revenge and vengeance? God save us from that. Let me finish with the story. A preacher was let go from a small country church. He'd served for years. The membership had complained that his regular preaching on error and judgment and hell and damnation was just overwhelming. And the church soon called a younger pastor and a local visitor decided that he would visit and hear the newcomer. He was surprised to hear this novice preacher also proclaim a message of holiness and divine justice and certain just eternal retribution toward rebels. And so the visitor afterwards, he inquired of a friend who happened to be one of the deacons he said, it seems like your new pastor believes and preaches the same message of hell and damnation as his predecessor. The old deacon smiled and replied, yes, but this one doesn't seem so happy about it all. And I think that's the difference. God promises judgment that is terrifying. And make no mistake, it is eternal. And this should break our hearts. And when it breaks our hearts, we are reflecting the character of God. Because Ezekiel 33, 11 says, Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. 
but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? And God's concern for his people Israel is the same concern he has for anyone who is set in disobedience, that they would turn and repent and live. And this should be our heart as well. And let me tell you, that's the reason we still draw breath. Because we have an opportunity to represent the good news of the gospel to people who so desperately need to hear it. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that you would work in our hearts individually and then as a church. We pray that we would be found faithful. We pray that we would be always on the alert for false teaching. We pray that we would glorify you, not only for your love and mercy, but also for your holiness and justice. But help us never to do so with some callous satisfaction. Help us grieve for the souls of those who are lost. Help us fear for those that will experience your judgment. And help us love them with the love of Jesus that they might come to repentance and faith. May this be the passion of our church. That you are holy. That we are not. That you have forgiven us. And that we have now the responsibility. The ministry of reconciliation, Paul calls it. That we might share this good news with others. Give us a passion to do so. In the glorious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? I've asked the worship team to lead us in this new song. I love the words. It's so appropriate for what we've just considered in the word. Think about these words. You can learn the song quickly and lift your voices as we honor this holy God. Only a holy God.
else can save me from all my failings? Who else would let me call him Father? Only a holy God. That's good news. And remember, the good news is so good because the bad news is so bad. This is what we share in our lives, with our words, the way we live. May God find us faithful in these things. We love you. God bless you. Have a great day. We look forward to coming back again next Lord's Day. But until then, let's live in the gospel. Amen? Have a great week. God bless you. You're dismissed.